Hello, I'm Barry Sullivan, Program Director for ACETA. It's my pleasure to introduce this spotlight presentation from Cyprus by Patrick Kane. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here today to talk about Programmable System on Chip. Um, I am the director of the Cyprus University Alliance Program, and uh, you have my email address here if you'd like to, to contact me, and also we'll be upstairs uh, tonight and tomorrow in uh, 303. Uh, my job um, is basically to form strategic partnerships with universities uh, to enable professors and students uh, to use Cyprus technology in the classroom, the lab, and, and, and so on. And uh, currently we have over 600 schools involved in the program, uh, mostly universities, but even down to the high school level, surprisingly, in, in some areas. So it's, it's really a very flexible technology that has a lot of broad usage. This is our website. The, uh, the red arrow just points out to a place where you can download a donation uh, request form for evaluation kits, and, and sometimes we donate a few more than evaluation kits uh, because um, we realize that budgets are, are constantly shrinking, seems, over the last several years in the university area. So we do have a, a donation program for kits, and we also have a very liberal uh, academic discount program on our kits. So please contact us uh, if, uh, if that's something you need to do. Um, why, why Cypress PSOC? Well, PSOC is a true programmable embedded system on chip. And by true programmable embedded system on chip, I mean not only does it have programmable, analog, or programmable digital and a microcontroller, it also has programmable analog. And that's the one thing that you don't see a, a lot of. You can, get, you can get digital logic and, and MCUs a lot of different places, but uh, programmable analog is, is fairly hard to come by. Now this is our basic architecture. I'm not going to go into depth here, but there's four basic subsystems. The microcontroller subsystem, which is either an 8051 based or ARM Cortex-M3 based. Then we have the UDBs, which are the um, uh, universal digital blocks. And then we have the, an analog subsystem which consists of both configurable and programmable analog, configurable in the sense that you have uh, discrete op amps, comparators, DACs, and things, and the op amp will always be an op amp, but you can put, uh, you can get to all three pins, so you can put components outside the device and do various filters and things. And the programmable analog is an op amp with uh, uh, a system network of uh, switch capacitors around it so that you can, you can program the, the uh, various functions in that area. And then of course you need a way for signals to, to get around the chip and that's where the programmable interconnect comes in and the general purpose I.O. So on the, high, on the high precision analog we like to say you have the best of both worlds and that is because uh, as I mentioned you've got this discrete components that are, that are, that are fairly precise and, and, and uh, good performance and then you have the programmable analog uh, which with Swiss capa switch capacitors and continuous time networks are, are more programmable. We also have added a digital uh, filter block which allows you to do IIR and FIR filters in um, hardware. And then in the software, uh, there's uh, basically a library of components, ADCs, amplifiers, DACs, and, and so on, communications, capacitive sensing, which is one of our big applications. And uh, the user designer would just pull these components out of the library, uh, put, them, uh, put them together, wire them up, and uh, then write some C code or assembly language, if you prefer, to, to control the hardware. So that's on the analog side. But on the digital side, as I mentioned, we have these universal digital blocks. It's a powerful uh, PLD-based system. Uh, each UDB can actually be thought of as a small 8-bit uh, processor. I'll, I'll show you why I can make that claim on the next slide. And uh, again, we have the same library of components, uh, digital components, even you know what you'd expect to find counters and timers and PWMs, but you even have it down to the Boolean logic level. So again, for, for teaching purposes, you could start out with digital fundamentals with Boolean logic uh, with this uh, technology. Now, the reason I say that each one of these could be thought, each one of these universal digital blocks could be thought of as a, a small 8-bit microcontroller is because you have all the basic components of, of what is the textbook definition of an MCU, which is an ALU, uh, FIFO, some, you know, some memory, data registers, and then the PLDs, which we term 12C4s, 
which means 12 inputs and four outputs, either registered, synchronous, or asynchronous. And there's two of those. And you can tie up to four of these UDBs together to make 32-bit functions. And you can also, if you prefer, you can build your own components using Verilog. So there's a lot of flexibility here. You can use the library components. You can kind of hack the library components and modify them. Or you can start from scratch and kind of build your own components as well. <clears throat> now, we do offer training uh, both face-to-face. Uh, -face. In fact, I have a, a, a workshop at the university uh, Tuesday, and we um, uh, have downloadable videos, training videos online, and, and webinars that, uh, that uh, students can look at and, and use to get familiar with the technology. This is a uh, screenshot of our PSOC Creator software. All Cypress uh, design software is free. So you can download that at our website. So the software is free. They all come with a free compiler, uh, although um, if somebody wants to buy a, a different compiler for ARM Cortex-M3 or 8051, they can, and it will bolt into the software. But uh, they come with compilers, and again, all that's free. And this is an actual slide that shows real products where PSOC is, is in. So one of the reasons students really need to learn this technology is because there's over 8,000 companies using it, and it's just something else they need to put in their toolbox along with, uh, you know, FPGAs and, and the other things they're being taught. So uh, it, it uh, looks good on their resume, in other words. Now to the, to, you know, to the nuts and bolts. How can PSOC really enhance engineering education? Well, it's, it's hard to go in depth in this, this time limit, but please come see me upstairs if you, you want to more detailed explanations. But basically, it's, it's multidisciplinary. There's one platform that can be used in a variety of classes, um, embedded controls, robotics, and so on, mechatronics. In fact, um, I was a little surprised. I'm not anymore. But when, um, when uh, PSOC mechanical engineering programs were, were adopting PSOC, and uh, you know, after I thought about it a little, it's what is mechanical these days that doesn't have some electronic component to control it, maybe a bicycle or a broom, uh, something, something like that. But So there's a, a surprising number of uh, mechanical uh, programs using, using PSOC, mechanical engineering. Um, so the design environment is, is schematic-based. Uh, you take the components from the library, you put them on the schematic, again, you wire them up, and then um, you, you don't have to actually use the microcontroller. So there's some things you can do that are purely hardware, but if you are using the microcontroller, um, you would write some C code or some assembly code to control the hardware. So it's basically you've got low-cost hardware. You've got um, the online and face-to-face -face training. Of course, because it's reprogrammable, it's reusable, and we, have, we are coming out with a variety of boards, um, which I'll show you in a second here. The other thing is that these technologies in PSOC, analog, digital, and microcontroller, do not have to be used all together, of course. That's the most powerful use of them and in the commercial world. That's how it's typically used. But again, for, for teaching, you can just use the analog and just teach it like a filters class or, or analog fundamentals or just use the digital and just teach digital fundamentals, like I said with the Boolean logic elements, for example. Or again, just use the microcontroller and, and you know, teach C programming. So you have uh, the other thing, too, is that I think in, in a lot of schools, space is at a premium. So the, the, the other benefit, I think, for PSOC is that with one lab, one physical lab, one software tool, uh, one or two different development kits, although the architecture is the same, the software is the same, you can teach, you could literally run a lab 24-7 and have a different uh, topic in there every, every three or four hours or so. So um, uh, that's another benefit is, is uh, you can do all this in one, one physical lab without too many changes. Uh, this shows some of some of the kits that we have. We have uh, a lot more than these, but these are typically the ones that uh, students start out with. The one on the top is called a first touch kit. That has a uh, capacitive sensing. It has an accelerometer. It's got a proximity sensor and a thermistor on it, and you can't see it, but on the bottom there's 28 pins on that board that it can be plugged into a breadboard. And the white socket is actually for a radio, uh, a 2.4 uh, gig uh, ISM radio. So you can do wireless, uh, you can do capacitive sensing, and so on. The one in the middle 
is um, uh, another version of the board which offers more uh, ways to get on and off the board. You see you've got some buses or some, some headers there that you can plug external boards into. You've got a, a place where you can solder components or you can stick a breadboard on there and, and use it that way. And then finally at the bottom is the, uh, the big PSOC board that is uh, modularized. So all three technologies, PSOC 1, 3, and 5, uh, go with that board on the bottom, and uh, they stick in the modules there. Um, right here is where the modules go. And again, that has the same radio, the cap sense. Uh, all these chips have USB built in, by the way. So they are USB peripherals, not hosts, but they all have USB built in. And um, so in summary, let me just say that we have world-class technology, not just PSOC, uh, but USB uh, is one of Cypress' uh, other big markets, as well as uh, memory. Cypress started out 30 years ago as a memory pr uh, company. So all of these technologies are available um, to you uh, for projects or for classes. And um, here's, again, our web portal. We have an online newsletter. Um, and again, there's over 600 schools using PSOC now. So we'd like you, some of you are already using it, but those of you who aren't, we'd like you to join us. So I th may have a minute or two for some questions, if anyone has any um, questions. Thank you. Yes. So how, is, how simple or difficult is the interface for students to do this if they want to do filter design with op amps versus breadboarding something? I can see advantages to breadboarding, but what are they writing code to breadboard it in your PSOC virtually, or what is it that they're actually going to do? Well, in, in, I mean, the, the op amps are really you know, inside there. Right. And um, in that case, like to do a filter, you'd probably use one of the discrete op amps and put an RC network or, a, you know, outside the chip, just like you would with an analog devices op amp chip or some other op amp chip. But um, the, th the thing is, is that you have uh, the ability to write some C code to change some of the hardware on the fly, like, you know, sampling rates and things like that, if you want to. Um, and, I, I, you know, it, I think it's, it's just as easy, if not easier, than using a discrete op-amp chip. Uh, and then on a follow-on, you mentioned, oh, yeah, you can do your digital experiments in here as well. Right. So does it use Verilog or, I mean, or is, once again, you've got the C code okay. for everything else, but we're trying to teach other methods. I'm just again, there's library components, so it's just as easy as laying down a schematic and hooking, in, hooking up the, the, the circuitry in an input pin and an output pin, for example, uh, with or without writing any code, because you don't have to use the microcontroller. But you can. So there's, there's, there's different ways of doing this. And um, it's, it, you know, it, is, it can be totally separated. Again, you know, in the commercial world, you wouldn't use it that way because it's a, a waste of resources. But for teaching purposes, to have one architecture and one software design flow that students would get used to and understand and not have to learn, you know, something new each semester other than, you know, the fundamentals of analog or digital, um, I think it's really a great, great tool. Come on, I'll be happy to give you a, a demo later today or tomorrow. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you.